It is six weeks now since President Putin ordered his troops into Ukraine. Tonight, in a special Sky News programme, we get the view of the war from inside the Kremlin. Good evening. It is an act of aggression condemned as a barbaric attack on an independent democratic country. Cities have been bombarded, towns devastated, and countless lives have been lost. And now, growing evidence of war crimes is emerging. Evidence dismissed by Russia as a sham. Tonight, in his first British broadcast interview since the war began, I speak to the man who does much of the talking for Vladimir Putin his spokesman, Dmitry Peskov. He joins me live from his office in Moscow. And thank you very much for being with us. First of all, um, do you accept that the first weeks of this invasion have not gone according to plan for President Putin? Well, first of all, I would rather disagree with your qualification of what is going on. You didn't mention uh, the, the, the qualification of special military operation. And you didn't say a word about the reasons for the special and military operation. Uh, you, because it's a war, isn't it? It's not a special military operation. It is a full-scale, illegal war. It's a very serious operation uh, with, with uh, uh, quite heavy consequences, yes. Uh, I would, I would like to start to start with the reason of this operation, actually. It's very important to, to remind you. Uh, 2014, this is the year when the legal history of uh, Ukraine was changed during uh, an illegal coup. And after that, Ukraine has started to become uh, an anti-Russian center. Everything that, that occurred in Ukraine was aimed against our country. And uh, during the last couple of decades, actually, we were concerned about our security. NATO, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, started to move towards our body, uh, our boundaries. Yeah. And we were, we were really nervous about that. But, but Ukraine, was... but Ukraine, let's be honest about this. Ukraine posed yes. no threat to Russia, and NATO is a defensive organization that also poses no threat to Russia. And just my point at the beginning was that you have retreated. The reason I said it's not going to plan is you've retreated from the capital. President Zelensky is still in power. You've lost thousands of troops. You've lost six generals, uh, hundreds of tanks and other equipment. It's, it's a humiliation, really, isn't it? No, no. It's a wrong understanding of what is going on. But what, what is uh, wrong about what I've just said? Well, nearly everything. Nearly everything. Well, but you've uh, lost well, thousands uh, of troops. Yeah, let's go through it. You've lost thousands of troops. How many troops yes, have you lost? We have, we have, we have significant losses of troops, and uh, it's 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 a huge tragedy for us. Uh, now, about two regions, Kiev and the Chernigov regions. Uh, so actually, the troops were really withdrawn from that region as an act of a goodwill during the negotiations between two delegations, Russian and Ukrainian delegations. And it, wanted, it was an act of a goodwill just to, um, uh, to uh, well, to, to, to lift tension from those regions and in order to show that Russia is really ready to create comfortable conditions for continuation of negotiations. Yeah, but it's just not true, is it? Because you continued, if it was, if it was a, a measure of goodwill, why then did you continue to bombard Mariupol in the way that you have to devastate that city? If you really wanted to facilitate peace talks, you would have had a ceasefire. But you carried on bombarding Mariupol and shelling Kharkiv and other places. So it's, it's not really true, is it? If you let me, I'll try to explain. Well, first of all, Mariupol is a part of Lugansk People's Republic. You know, we recognize them as an independent state. And actually, the premier goal of the operation was to uh, was to, to 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 assist those people of two people's republics that were suffering for eight years from heavy shelling from Ukrainian military people. And by the way, during those eight years, no one would uh, would uh, mention that 
would mention those atrocities. No, no one way in that Europe, no one in Great Britain. Even if it was true, that doesn't justify a full scale evasion, invasion, does it? I mean, let's keep this in proportion. I mean, it, it, all, are you determined? Let you, you mentioned Mariupol is part of, it's part of Ukraine. Are you determined to take Mariupol, whatever the human cost, whatever the cost in civilian life? Mariupol is going to be uh, liberated from uh, nationalistic battalions. And uh, we hope it will happen sooner than later. So liberation, the you describe it as liberation. So the pounding of Mariupol, the pounding of civilian buildings, the pounding of a hospital, that's liberation, is it? Well, hospital, hospital was a fake. Hospital was a fake and... Uh, uh, we have very serious reasons to believe that it was a fake, and we insist on that. This is number one. Number two. Well, unfortunately, just say, you, you did say that one of the, 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 the famous photograph, or infamous photograph, of a woman on a stretcher, which you said was an, she, you said she was an actor. She turned out, a doctor told us later, and to have died. Stayed. She told us to have, she died. So let's not talk about... That I mean, how many civilians? Let me ask you this: How many civilians do you think have died in Ukraine so far? I don't want to operate any figures that are not confirmed or double confirmed. Uh, we have we have to be very careful. We have to be very careful in pronouncing any figures because we're living in a uh, during a days of, of fakes, fakes and lies well, let, that let, we. Let me tell you this. That we meet every day. Let me tell you this. So your UN, UN ambassador has said there are no credible reports of civilian casualties. And as regards Butcher, according to the, your Ministry of Defence on April the 3rd, and I quote, not a single local resident has suffered from any violent action while Russia was in control. I mean, do you really expect the world to believe that? We insist on that. We insist on that and we insist that the whole situation, the situation is butchered, is a well-staged uh, insinuation, nothing else. So let me just show you. And uh, those poor people, those let poor people, and we're seeing dead bodies there. Yeah. And those dead bodies there were not victim of Russian military personnel. You see, this is astonishing for you to talk like this. Let me just show you this satellite image from... Uh, Bucha on the outskirts of Kiev. And this is an image taken on the 28th of February. Uh, we have geolocated it to Yabolanska Street in Bucha before Russia had control of the area. It's a normal looking street. Let's compare it to an image of the exact same location on the 19th of March, just a couple of days after Russia had taken control of the area. And now you see the shadows bodies strewn uh, along the street. And we know their bodies yeah, know, from this video. We know those Maxar's well, pictures. We well, know we, those Maxar's no, pictures. No, but we know their bodies from this video released, I'm showing now, on social media on the 1st of April, which we've geolocated as well. We have blurred the bodies yeah. for viewers. And you can see this body is in the same place as the one seen in the satellite image. The body hasn't moved. The car drives along further, you can see, stops at two more bodies again matching the position of the ones in that satellite image. And so it continues with everybody on the street. And you maintain that all this was staged. You're talking about a fake. This shows that dead yeah. bodies appeared while you control the area. Russian troops killed those people, didn't they? If you have another 20 or to 30 minutes, I will explain step by step why it all fakes. If you have this additional time, let's go on, I will tell you. Yeah, well, you're, you're saying uh -huh. it's fake, so there's not much point going on, but we've verified it, we've geolocated it, we've got the dates yes. from the satellite well, imagery we know, company. We know, pretty well, we know pretty well the company that, uh, that has supplied international community with these satellite pictures. This is a Maxar company that is in a, in, a, in a very tight cooperation with Pentagon, with the Pentagon. And uh, yeah, it's interesting, it's interesting to know, and what you would probably be uh, uh, interesting to know, that uh, they don't have actually exact dates on their, on their uh, footage, on their satellite images. So it's, it's impossible to, to allocate a, an exact date 
of uh, those satellite pictures. Okay, let's have a and look at this. Okay. We still insist that those pictures were made after Russian troops were withdrawn from that area. Okay, well, what about this one then? Because our team has also verified this next video to early March in the same area of Butcher. And here we see a woman with a bike named today as Arena Filkina walking along uh, Yabolanska Street when Russian troops were in control. Around the corner is an armoured vehicle identified by our team as a Russian military vehicle. So the Russians are there. You can see the vehicle fire, a shot which creates a plume of smoke exactly where Irina was standing with her bike. Now, how, after how, the... How, how after, let me finish... So if I could just finish, yeah. Ms. Perth, sorry. After the Russians yeah. have withdrawn, this video, geolocated to the exact same spot, showed Irina lying dead on the ground. So there can be no real doubt, surely, that this uh, shows Russian troops killing a civilian. Yeah. It, it's right there I'll on, on film. I'd appreciate if you could be more specific. I'd appreciate if you could be more specific. How could you exactly identify the Russian tank or whatever, what was standing? Yeah. Why, why do you think it was Russian? OK, well, I think we we got a still that shows the Russian tower. You can see, if you look at that, you can see the V marking clearly on the side. Yeah, but there. those it, are not the tanks that, that, that were shooting. That suggests... That it's a different that, position. They are, they are the exact same uh, armoured vehicles that were on that street. I mean, look, we've, we've no, verified what it. What you're geolocated. showing right now... What you're showing right now are not the exact tank that was shooting. Let's, you have to be very careful. You have to be very so, careful in what you are showing, just not to it repeat It is exactly face. the same armoured vehicle. I mean, so you deny that that happened. You're denying it's happened and you're saying it's being faked, basically. It's some sort of conspiracy. Is that right? We deny that Russian military uh, can have something in common with these atrocities and with dead bodies that were shown on the streets of Butcher. So let's just be clear here. What you are saying to the world, what you're saying to Ukrainians, what you're saying to, let's face it, the relatives of those victims that we've just seen there, and what you're saying to Russians, your own people, is that this is fabricated, it is fake, and that it is some sort of huge conspiracy of propaganda Stunt. I mean, do you do you realize how grotesque that sounds? Well, it's not a conspiracy, actually. It's a bold fake. It's a bold fake, and we've been speaking about that for a couple of days, but no one would listen to us. We've been presenting very detailed explanations on very various internet resources. If you're interested in that, we'll provide you with those internet resources. But, but to say it's a fake, it, you're suggesting it's a conspiracy between satellite imagery companies, between Ukrainians, between all the Western media. I mean, you're, you're suggesting it is a conspiracy. It's exactly what you're saying. Well, of course, it can, it can be a play of fakes. It can be a play of lies. Okay. You can attach any, any date to a picture uh, that was made through satellite. OK, and well, then, what about... Well, we have, to, we have to doubt sometimes. I mean, you cannot be without any investigation. So, but you doubt all the you time. You cannot be I mean, so sure okay. about blaming anything, everything on Russia. Well, let me put this to you then. Human Rights Watch, uh, the organisation, they've already documented, uh, documented hundreds of apparent war crimes, and these include, I've got it here, repeated rape of a woman in front of her child after her husband was killed, other cases of rape, two cases of summary execution, one of six men, uh, the other of one man, other cases of torture, unlawful violence, threats against civilians. I've got the dates, I've got the uh, witness statements, we can go through it if you want, but these are documented killings with witness evidence and corroborated, by the way, today by Amnesty International. And we've, and we've yet to discover what's happening in Mariupol. Do, I mean, don't you see it's just preposterous to sort of issue a blanket denial of all these things? It should all be very thoroughly uh, investigated. I agree with you. 
But at the same time, uh, we have uh, even the bigger amount of, uh, uh, of uh, eyewitnesses and people who took part in the, these various situations in, in Mariupol, in, in Bucha, and other, uh, other towns of, uh, of Ukraine. They were, uh, uh, they were telling us the terrible stories of uh, those nationalistic battalion, uh, battalion military, military people, torturing people, not letting them leave the town, not letting them uh, uh, go out of the town, flee the town. So we, we, we also have these uh, eyewitnesses. So I mean, but you, do, but you don't, but you don't want to listen to them. No, to those but we do. We do. We've just been carrying a story this afternoon about claims of uh, Ukrainian uh, war. I spoke to the chief prosecutor of Ukraine on this program the other day, and she said that all all war crimes would be investigated and all the evidence would be passed on to the. International Criminal Court. The difference. The we difference are, is one. We are interested. The, we are interested in investigating everything. But the difference. And we, is, we also collect. We also collect evidence and proofs for crimes that were committed by nationalistic battalions. But the difference is one of scale. But it is also that they are agreeing to investigate. You are saying it is not true. It is a fake. Before you've even investigated. Well, we have to say that it's not true because we're hearing that everything is blamed on Russia. And we, 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 we completely disagree with that. And by the way, I would have a suggest, a humble suggest to you, a uh, suggestion. If you make a story about crimes in Ukraine, and if you speak to Ukrainian prosecutor general, why don't you speak to Russian prosecutor general to, to make an objective picture, to present Two sides. We'd love to Two do that. Okay, we will do that. Let's just suppose then that you are, you know, what you are saying is right and that you have not, your troops have not committed these crimes. Will you, presumably then, you will happily cooperate with the International Criminal Court. If you're not guilty of any of these things, presumably you will cooperate with the International Criminal Court. Even We're if not, you don't recognize that court. We do not support and we do not recognize International Criminal Court and we're not the, the only country in the world who are doing that. So uh, this is number one. And we are interested in uh, really independent and, and uh, objective investigation of all the crimes. But we want just to, to we, we want to understand what could be the format of such an investigation because we, we have a bitter experience of international investigations, like with the, uh, with the grounded Korean aircraft, uh, international investigation, and we were, not, and we were not let into that investigation. So we cannot consider it to be objective. So, but, so I mean, there, are other, there are other special bitter, tribunals. Uh, bitter, yeah. There are other special tribunals that you could cooperate with. My, my only point is that if you haven't done this, then why don't you just cooperate with the tribunals or the International Criminal Court? Well, we're not speaking any tribunals. We don't know about the existence of tribunals. And I repeat, we do not recognize International Court. Let me, let me put this to you. You deny responsibility then quite clearly. What you can't deny is that civilians, many civilians, including women and children, have died as a result of this onslaught and they would be alive today had you not invaded Ukraine. I think it's 142 children so far. You, you yourself have children, you have a young daughter. When you see the images, how, how does it make you feel? How do you sleep at night? It's not about my sleep at night, actually. And this is about, this is about Ukrainian military and Ukrainian nationalistic uh, military personnel trying to use civil civil people as a shield, as a civil civil shield. So they're covering themselves with civil people and not letting them flee the town or flee the flee the city. And from the very beginning, Russian military uh, were never shelling civil ob objects. 
They were just aiming and using high uh, precision missiles um, uh, to to uh, to attack military infrastructure of Ukraine because well, there, must be, well, there must have been, there must have been a lot of, of well sir forgive me for interrupting but there must have been a lot of Ukrainian military in a lot of civilian buildings then because our reporters have been out and about in many of these towns exactly, and cities exactly and, this is the and, point no the, i mean it is defies belief that many of the targets that we've seen destroyed are military uh, targets, But I was talking to you really, not as a Kremlin spokesman, I was talking to you, you know, as a father, as a human being. What, when you see these images, how do you sleep at night? That, that, is, it was, that was really my question. That's a tragedy. That's a tragedy and uh, uh, our military are doing their best to, to bring an end to that operation. And we do hope that in coming days, in, 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 in foreseeable future, this operation will reach its goals or will finish it by the negotiations between Russian and Ukrainian delegation. I mean, do you think this can possibly end in a negotiation or talks after what has happened? It can. It can. It will strongly depend on the um, uh, so on con consistency of Ukrainian position, and to what extent they will be ready to they will be ready to meet uh, to meet our conditions. Boris Johnson has said that Russia's and I quote: "This is a quote: Russia's despicable attacks on innocent civilians in Irpin and Butcher are yet more evidence that Putin and his army are committing war crimes in Ukraine. We will not rest until justice is." Served. What, what's your message to Boris Johnson? Well, uh, he's very loud in his rhetorics about Russia from the very beginning of the operation. So, uh, in our understanding, he's, he's rather not constructive in his attitude. Uh, we have never heard any, any uh, similar rhetorics coming from Boris Johnson during the last eight years, when people in Donbas were killed by Ukrainian nationalists when they were heavily bombarded and shelled by heavy artillery. We have never heard a word coming from but Mr. Johnson. But it is scarcely comparable. Does, does, in light of what Mr. Johnson has said, does Mr. Putin worry about ending up in a war crimes court? No, he's not. D have you talked to him about that? Does he realise that it's a possibility? Well, uh... We don't see any possibility for that. But you have spoken about it, have you? We've read uh, lots of reports coming from various countries, uh, politologists and, and uh, so-called specialists in Russia d discussing such a possibility. But we don't consider it this this possibility to be to be realistic. You see, one of the problems with these blanket denials is that. Isn't the problem for you and for Mr. Putin that very few people outside Russia believe a, a single word that you say about all this? Uh, why do you think it's, it's, it's a few people? It's a great amount of people. It's a great amount of people who, understands, who understand concerns of Russia and who have been understanding those concerns during the last couple of de decades. And the world, you have to understand that the world is bigger than Europe and the United States and Great Britain. It's much bigger. Is it? But, wait, so, but I mean, in the last hour, you've just been kicked off the UN Human Rights Council. So that is what much of the world thinks about, about Russia and about the alleged war crimes coming out now. We're sorry about that. And we'll continue to defend our interests using every... Uh, possible legal means. We'll continue to defend our interests and to explain ourselves. The problem with the, 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 the lies that many international leaders are accusing you of is it's not new, is it? I mean, look, you can look just recently at the lies from Russia, just the recent ones. The Ukrainians, you say, shot down Malaysian Airlines MH17 in 2014. The Syrian opposition gassed their own people. The white helmets in Syria are terrorists who belong to al-Qaeda. Navalny, 
Putin's opponent collapsed because of his medication, not because he was uh, poisoned. The GRU agents who were in Salisbury came to see a cathedral. Um, in 2014, again, there are no Russian troops in Crimea or in Donbass. And then just a few weeks ago, we are not going to invade Ukraine. I mean, none of those are, none of those are true, are they? None of those are true. Which one of those is true? Step. Which one of those is true? Let's start from the very beginning. What was number one? Uh, Ukrainians, uh, you say the Ukrainians shot down Malaysian Airlines MH17 in 2014. I mean, you're not going to tell me that that's true. Well, there, are lots of, there are lots of evidence, there are lots of technical calculations, and they were all submitted to the court in The Hague. Uh, there is a huge deficit, deficit of, uh, of, of proofs and technical data in the uh, in the court, and there are uh, different points of view. And the GRU and, uh, agents in Salisbury came to see the cathedral. I mean, look, the problem here is a problem of trust, that people don't trust what you say. No, when you, you have, have, you have, have a major... Oh, Mr. Them, Pesco, let me finish. You have, when you have a major and you're country, not letting me respond. But you are a major country, hugely important culturally, hugely important historically, and people now don't believe a word the leadership says. That is a problem, isn't it? Which people? Many of the international people leaders. Of most of the West, many of the international leaders. Many of them, yes. They say that they don't believe. But many of the leaders believe and they tend to, they tend to, to explore, they tend to listen to our point of view, and we find their position much more constructive and much more attractive for us. But it's a problem in any dialogue, any future negotiations, that people don't trust you, particularly over NATO. I mean, Vladimir Putin embarked on this military operation, basically saying it was to counter, partly, partly to counter the expansion of NATO in Eastern Europe. Well, NATO has more troops now in Eastern Europe. Germany is increasing its defence spending. I mean, NATO is stronger now than it was. It's stronger, not weaker. Yeah, and thus we, we have to rebalance the situation and we, tell, we have to take additional measures to ensure our own security because we still, we are deeply convinced that NATO, NATO is, a, is a machine for confrontation. It's not a peaceful alliance. It was tailored for confrontation. And the main purposes of its existence to confront and to confront our country. But this see, is a very unfortunate situation, but we have to take it into account. But you see, NATO is a defensive organisation, and Finland, yes, exactly. Finland and Sweden, uh, Finland has an 800-mile border with your country. They now want to join NATO as a result of all this. What would, what would Russia do if, if Finland and Sweden joined NATO? We'll have to we'll have to rebalance the situation. I repeat again, and then we'll have to uh, we'll have to 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 make our western western flank uh, more more sophisticated in in terms of ensuring our security. But when you say rebalance, I mean President Putin has warned of serious military and political consequences. What I just wonder what that means. Well, we'll have to, you know, it's everything about mutual deterring, mutual deterring. And should one side, should one side, and we consider NATO to be one side, um, should one side be more powerful than the other, especially in terms of, of nuclear uh, arms, then it will constitute a threat for the whole architecture of security. And uh, it, it will take us to take additional measures, um, additional measures to th strengthen uh, our potential. But, but would you, just very quickly on that, uh, finally, would you consider that an existential threat? Because that is, you have said it would take an existential threat to use uh, nuclear weapons, which you've just mentioned. Uh, what exactly? Another, another enlargement of NATO? You would consider that an existential threat? No, I don't think so. Right. Would you consider pressure on your economy or, you know, uh, sanctions that you deemed were to, 
to wreck your economy, topple, even topple the regime. Would you consider that an existential threat? Well, no, no. We've been living under uh, under sanctions for for a couple of decades, and we, we we actually we actually we have got accustomed to that situation. And uh, uh, well, we we we've started to prepare ourselves for this sanctions uh, a year ago, a year ago, and so now, of course, we are in a very tight situation in terms of economy, but our economy is still on its feet. And we are uh, quite, quite well. Uh, we're, we're safe, maybe not safe and sound, but we're safe in terms of economy, in terms of macro stability. Just finally, and we're trying to, and we even we are trying to take advantage out of this situation, uh, giving a boost to to development of our productive sector, of our uh, national technologies, and so on and so forth. And just finally. Um... You've accused Ukraine of being a fascist uh, regime, but isn't it Russia that is an increasingly looking like a, a fascist state? All the hallmarks of fascism, the shutting down of all opposition, the strict censorship of the media, the sinister Z sign that is um, appearing, and just the climate of fear. Doesn't that all have a feeling of, of fascism about it? No, well, I consider it quite unacceptable to to, to speak about uh, in that way about my country. Uh, no, the answer is definitely no. The answer is no. And uh, uh, asking this question, I would suggest that you just recall last last uh, eight years with Nazis demonstrations on the streets of Kiev, on the streets of Lvov, with people. Uh, who were parts of Nazi uh, regiments during the Second World War, carrying Nazi, Nazi signs and Nazi flags, and uh, performing Nazi, 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 Nazi. Uh, the, I don't know the, the, the English but, word for that. Nazi. But yeah, but, yep, but, they, yeah, but th those Nazi demonstrations. They, well, it was a reality. It was a reality on the streets of Ukrainian but, cities. But, but, the, but the, the, the last election, the Nazi, the far right parties barely won two percent of the vote. I mean, you've got to keep this in proportion. Look, my final question is this: What is to come? Because only Vladimir Putin knows that. Uh, presumably, more bombardments. Presumably, more death. Who knows? Maybe more um, war crimes. My final question is this. You know, you've ripped away the future of two countries, immediate future for two countries, Russia, your own country, and Ukraine. And my final question is, is it all worth it? Honestly, is it all worth it? The whole story is about future. It's about guaranteeing our future. Just imagine a situation when a member of NATO, Ukraine, thinking about returning of Crimea, attacks Russia and attacks Russian Crimea, and using an article number five of NATO charter, NATO countries possessing nukes will have to defend Ukraine. Yeah. It should be a third world it, war. And what is being done but it is to save happen. us from any potential threat of such a war. But it was never going to happen, was it, like that? But listen... Mr. Peskov, uh, appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. There we are. A uh, insight of sorts, a revealing insight, in fact, uh, into President Putin's view of the war in Ukraine. Coming up, we'll have uh, reaction from the UK, Europe, and uh, also from Ukraine, as I speak to the spokesman for President Zelensky live. That's next.
Je suis allé commencer à l'égalité. Il y a Welcome back. This is Sky News. We've been speaking to President Putin's press secretary, Dmitry Peskov. He told us uh, Mariupol will be, in his words, liberated. He insisted that scenes that appear to show war crimes in and around the city of Bucha were staged. He described all civilian deaths in Ukraine as a tragedy, but he also insisted that uh, Russia's military campaign there will continue. So all that from uh, Vladimir Putin's spokesman, much of it no doubt strongly disputed by uh, the Ukrainian leadership. Joining me now live from Kiev is President Zelensky's uh, press secretary, Sergei Nikiforov. Thank you very much for being with us. I don't know whether you managed to hear uh, what I was talking to Mr Peskov about, but uh, what did you make of it, if you did? Good evening, Mark. Thanks for having me. I heard parts of it, uh, yes, the, um, uh, just before the break. So, I mean, basically, it was a flat denial of war crimes. He said, in essence, that it had been... all the incidents had been staged for the benefit of the Western media. Um, you know, um, let's... Uh, look, uh, Russian officials were telling that um, Ukrainians... Uh, had uh, shut down MH17. Uh, it appeared uh, they didn't. Uh, Russian officials had said that uh, they didn't poison Navalny. It appeared they did. Russian officials had said that uh, they didn't poison, uh, uh, there was no Salisbury poisoning, Skripal family poisoning. It appears it was. Uh, worth mentioning also, it, it's a very long, it's a very old story, but worth mentioning here Litvinenko story, right? Both committed on the, on the UK soil. Just before the war, Russian officials were telling that uh, they are not going to attack Ukraine. They were going to attack Ukraine. So um, all these lies repeatedly said by Russians appear to be false, you know? So... Is there any reason to believe Mr. Peskov now? I, I highly doubt that. Tell me about what's happening in Bucha and in the other places north of, um, of Kiev that have, the, the Russians have moved away from. Uh, what, what is going on and what are you finding there? Yes, Russians, actually, they didn't move away. They were forced to uh, uh, withdraw from there because they had no uh, military success during, you know, during weeks and weeks. So they were forced to retreat to concentrate their efforts on the eastern part of Ukraine because they failed to, to do at least anything just uh, uh, next to Kiev. They, they, they failed to even approach Kiev. They were stopped... Uh, Again, as you said, in Bucha, in Irpeni, it was those uh, small uh, towns uh, to the uh, uh, northwest of Kiev. So they left them, and as uh, Ukrainian forces were uh, taking over those uh, small uh, towns, they uh, discovered these uh, horrible, horrible things like civilian mass graves, mass graves filled with uh, corpses of civilians. Many people were um, uh, shot in the in the back of their heads, so clearly executed. Uh, many of them had their hands and the legs tied. The majority of killed now is more than 400 corpses uh, are uh, civilians. Are civilians, right? And you there will are, pass the evidence. We have to. Sorry yes. to interrupt. You yes. you will pass the evidence on to the international criminal court with you because uh, will you because for sure. Russia, I for mean, sure. one of the things sure. he was pointing out was that Russia is now claiming that Ukrainians are uh, committing war crimes. Uh, will those be investigated as well? Uh, what do you mean? So so uh, I spoke to the, I, the, the he was claiming that uh, the Ukrainians are also committing war crimes. I mean, clear, not, you know, there is no equivalence in terms of scale or anything, but will they, be will they be investigated as well? I spoke to your chief prosecutor and she suggested they would be. 
Uh, yes, all, all the presumed war crimes committed on Ukrainian soil will be investigated, both presumably committed by Ukrainians or Russians. And uh, to be honest, Ukraine has a successful, very successful experience of actually investigating uh, war crimes uh, of uh, some of the Ukrainian troops after the initial stage of the war in 2014-2015. They were, uh, those uh, crimes were investigated, those people were brought to court and they were sentenced. So Ukraine has a successful story of uh, persuading war criminals. Uh, can Russia, does Russia have the same story of persuading its own war criminals? I know nothing about that. Just finally, uh, you must fear what is eventually going to be found in Mariupol. Uh, let alone Mariupol, we still have to investigate everything that happened in Kiev Oblast, because after Ir Irpin and after Bucha, we have Barodyanka, where the situation is, according to some of our officials, is twice as, as, as hard, as grave as in, uh, in Bucha. So we have to reach all the smallest cities in Kiev Oblast. And of course, uh, seeing we, we're, we have very limited access to, to pictures and, from, and to videos from Mariupol, but even seeing that, uh, it's really, it's terrifying to, to expect, to imagine what could have happened there, because I mean, the scale of the city, because Mariupol is a half a, half a million, has a half a head, unfortunately had half a million of inhabitants. So, um, yeah, you're right. Uh, you're right. We uh, we tend to to believe that those uh, um, the behavior of uh, Russian troops, the the feeling of impunity, has the you know systematic character. So the, the Baradyanka and Irpin and Bucha, unfortunately, um, I mean, very hard to say, but unfortunately, we believe that those are not the exceptions. That's the, it's yeah. a general rule. It's manner of behavior of Russian troops and the, the feeling of impunity that allows them to uh, commit such an atrocities towards civilians. Okay, Mr. Nikiforov, look, appreciate your time as well. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Right, let's just uh, get some reaction from the UK now. We're joined by Tom Tugendhat, Chair of the Commons Foreign Affairs Select Committee. Uh, good evening, Tom. Thank you for being with us. Uh, the first question, really, if you heard the Leading interview Mark. with uh, Mr Peskov, what, I mean, what did you make of what he had to say? Well, it's, I'm, I think you, you set it out pretty clearly in your last question when you listed the catalogue of lies that we've seen from um, this extraordinary administration of deception and fraud. Um, you know, the, the tragedy is that these lies aren't meant to be believed. What they're meant to do is they're meant to convince Russians that there is no such thing as the truth and that everybody's as bad as the other. But the reality is, I'm afraid, is the people of Butcher know only too well and many people around the rest of Ukraine uh, have sadly experienced in the last four or five weeks is that what Putin is doing is uh, exporting rape and murder as a form of foreign policy. Uh, and it's utterly disgraceful. And uh, once again, I mean, it was a blanket denial. Uh, it was that the pictures are concocted, that, that, that they are fake, that, uh, you know, they've been edited. It's purely propaganda. <laughs> but it's blatantly obvious it's not. Uh, we all know that Russia invaded Ukraine. Ukraine did not invade Russia. We all know, as it's, you know, it's historically completely proven, uh, and many of us have visited and seen, uh, that uh, Russia occupied Crimea, much as it's also occupied uh, parts of Georgia uh, in uh, South Ossetia and Abkhazia. You know, this isn't, this is, these aren't lies that are meant to be believed. That's the extraordinary thing. These are lies that are meant to convince you that there is simply no such thing as the truth. They're not supposed, you know, you're not supposed to walk out of here thinking, oh, well, maybe the Russians have, have got a point. You're meant to think, uh, that actually everybody's as bad as the other. And the reality is Putin is a mafia warlord. And what's stolen, first of all, is a great country, Russia. 
and he is using his power to murder Russians uh, across his own country, and now he's using his power to murder Ukrainians and others uh, around uh, Eastern Europe. And indeed, as you know, he tried to murder uh, the Skripals in Salisbury, he murdered Dawn Sturgis in Salisbury, and he murdered Litvinenko in London. So he's trying to export that violence that we uh, know him for. OK, uh, Tom Tugendhat, appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Right, uh, much of what uh, Dmitry Peskov said was to deny human rights abuses by uh, Russian troops, as we've just been discussing. I'm joined now from Ukraine, uh, from David Miliband, president of the International Rescue Committee. Uh, I, I'm not sure whether you are. I think you're in... Are you in New York? I'm sorry, <laughs> David. You're in uh, New York. But, I mean, first of all, these... You know, what, what do you make of what is emerging from places like... Bucha and those other places around the north of Kiev. Ah, you just get, you need to unmute yourself, David. It's not going well, is it? Have uh, I got you now? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I've um, got you now. It, it just shows you never never take anything for granted, even on live TV. Um, what I was going to say, Mark, is that anyone who has lived through the war in Syria or the war in Yemen, or the situation in Afghanistan, the conflict there, knows that international law is increasingly optional rather than compulsory in the conduct of war around the world. And so it would be wrong to say that there's surprise at what is coming out from Ukraine, but it should still be shocking. It must retain the capacity to shock, to see that level of sadism uh, and persecution that uh, has taken place. And I think that those images that are coming out and the documentation behind them speaks absolutely profoundly to the kind of world that we want to live in. Because after 1945, for the first time in human history, laws of war were put into international law. And the test now is, does the impunity that's been referred to regularly over the last two days, does that continue? And does it continue to feed on itself? Or does accountability make a comeback? Yeah, I mean, that's the point. How important is accountability? And do you think it can, it can uh, come about? Well, it's absolutely vital because impunity feeds on itself. There's no steady state in this. And we've seen over the last 15 years that from the high point of 2005-06, when every country, 193 countries, committed to the idea that the international system had a responsibility to protect individuals under siege from their own governments, that's been eroded. Uh, and in many parts of the world, in conflict, it's been thrown away. That's how you've seen more civilians being killed. It's how you've seen uh, more use of chemical weapons in the Syrian case. It's how you've seen bombing of hospitals and schools. I saw a figure of 89 hospitals and schools in Ukraine now uh, bombed. And so accountability is absolutely fundamental to the international regime of law. We may think it's a long way away from us in the UK or in the US, but the truth is, uh, impunity on the battlefield is the tip of the iceberg because it's propped up by a set of structures that support the abuse of power, which is what we're talking about. Accountability starts with transparency, and this may be an occasion when social media, rather than fostering hate, actually uh, shows what's really happened and can play a positive role because the documentation that's been done, including uh, footage that shows when uh, different bodies appeared on various streets uh, in the outskirts of Ukraine, in the outskirts of Kiev, including in Bucha, that's very, very important indeed. So there's, yeah. first of all, the documentation, but secondly, then there's a follow-up, including by the International Criminal Court, which has announced an inquiry, which is a good first step. OK, and just a quick word on the broader humanitarian situation, David, with the Ukrainians urging people now in southeast, uh, southeastern Ukraine to, to move. Um, it must be incredibly difficult at the moment to, to cope with what is going on, particularly, I'm thinking, in Poland. Well, yes, the refugee situation is obviously they're safe, but there's a massive organisational task. For the internally displaced in Ukraine, about 7 million, there is good access. But for those caught under siege in the east and south of the country, uh, Mariupol being the poster child, but in other areas as well, that's where there's enormous danger to life and to limb. And that's going to have to be the international focus and is certainly the focus of organisations like mine that are working in Poland and in the west of Ukraine, but also want to assert that civilians all across the country have a right to international aid and to life. 
And how hard is it now to get you know, aid further into Ukraine? I mean, I know that in, the, in Poland, on the border area, Lviv and so forth, but getting aid you know, further into Ukraine where you know, we, don't, we don't know the state of some people. Well, it's pretty good across much of the country. We're focusing on health, on child protection, on cash distribution. And obviously, the Russian retreat means that there are more parts of the country where it's safer and where access can take place, and frankly, where the Ukrainian government can coordinate things in the areas of health. But there are these battle zones in the south and the east which remain very dangerous, and in the case of Mariupol, absolutely strangled, and where it's impossible to get in. Even the ICRC, the International Committee on the Red Cross, has not been able to get in. So we're working. Uh, the, the fact that the battlefront is being narrowed is in some ways helpful, but obviously the great fear is that there's absolute pulverization for those who are caught in the areas that are still in conflict. Yeah, I mean, it does seem, Mr Peskov was saying when I was interviewing him, he said that they are going to continue with this in Mariupol and uh, that whole area. So, I mean, what are your fears about the, you know, the coming weeks? Well, the fear is that we have a humanitarian Chernobyl, uh, effectively towns and cities that are turned into rubble, and frankly, people that are turned into rubble as well. Mariupol had 400,000 people, it now has 100,000. God knows what they're going through because they've had no heat, light, water, electricity, food, medicine for six weeks. And so this is desperate straits. And we've seen that in Grozny, uh, in Chechnya, in Aleppo, in Syria, uh, there is a willingness to raise a city to the ground, including all of its people. And that's why I think it, we have to understand there's a pulverization campaign that brooks no interest in humanitarian law, international law, or even human life. OK, uh, David Miliband, thank you very much for being with us uh, this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Well, there we are. That was... Uh... The view from the Kremlin, uh, thank you for watching. Coming up, we'll have more reaction to my interview with uh, Vladimir Putin's spokesman, uh, Dmitry Peskov. We'll have uh, all that reaction uh, at the top of the hour.